but I'm really excited for that. Also, again, just to um, piggyback on this Friday, you know, um, I've traveled and done many, many concerts, events, ministries, whatever you want to call it. And the tools aren't bad, right? Uh, having dimmed lights or whatever it might be. Some places they do fog machines and strobe lights and they do a big extravagant, you know, presentation. Those aren't bad in and of themselves. There's just smoke and it's just lights and it's just stuff. Those things in and of themselves are just things. But our hearts are what matter. Our hearts is everything. It's if, if I were to get up on a stage and perform from a heart to want to be seen, to want to be heard, to get the glory for myself, then I, sh I have no business doing that in the name of the Lord. If anything, I just do it in the world. That's what that's for. But there's a way to do this where people who are still stuck in that way can come and experience God and get free from that way. I have, I'm telling you, I have had the privilege of seeing many people, young and old, have an encounter with God through Christian rap because the message of Jesus met them there and the Spirit of God saved them. I've, I've experienced it. And there are people in this room that were at those concerts long ago. Oh, I feel old saying that. but And, and they were touched and moved on by God, just like you will be inside of a service like this. So I encourage you, if you know people who don't really go to church traditionally, like on a Sunday morning, but they'll come and actually in, in, and be a part of like a concert, a rap concert or something, bring them. They'll come, especially if they know you, they'll come. And they are going to get the gospel presented to them. Amen? Dang. Amen? Be excited about that. That's called evangelism, guys. We're supposed to win the lost. We're supposed to do things to win the lost. Amen? So we're going to do that. Um, also, what I want to say is uh, don't, uh, don't be so reserved. When you come, enjoy yourself. Enjoy the time that the Lord has given us. If you want to two-step, in the name of love of Christ, you can do that, right? You can do that. Don't, don't feel reserved, but ha let there be some freedom for yourself. You know what I mean? Enjoy the time that the Lord gives us, amen? Because I am. I'm going to enjoy the time. I want to pray one more time over this word. We're actually continuing in our teaching of, in the season of teaching of trust God, trusting God. It's been good so far. Last week, we talked about the bowls of soup. Anybody go home going, I have too many bowls of soup. Anybody? I got a lot of bowls of soup. I need to get rid of these bowls of soup. <clears throat> That's good. That's good. As long as you're looking at Christ, it is good. If all you do is stare at the bowl of soup, that's really bad. Because God does not want any of the truth and the teachings of the truth to be condemning to you, but liberating. The liberation comes by saying, I admit it, I make things bowls of soup. And if you haven't, <laughs> some people are like, what is he talking about, bowls of soup? This church must really like food, man, popcorn and bowls of soup. Go watch last week's message. Yes, extra butter. Go watch last week's message and you'll understand what I mean. It's things that you place in your life that you love where God should be. It's idols and things that you place in your life. So um, if, if, don't let that, looking at that, become a distraction. The whole purpose of seeing a bowl of soup is to lay it at the altar and give it to Jesus so you can receive Christ more. You can, you can have more of Jesus. So I just want to encourage you that. But this week, we're going to talk about offenses. Yay. <laughs> Anybody excited about this? We're going to talk about offenses, but we have to pray because some of us might be carrying some right now. And we want to be free. Amen? So let's pray. Father, we come before you and we just... We don't even know how to ready our hearts. But we're asking that we just come honestly where we are. We're asking that you just help us where we are. That this word would actually free us and liberate us and it would not bind us up. And we're asking for your spirit to come and help us through this time because we're gonna need your guidance, Lord. We're gonna need your ears to help us to hear. We're gonna need your mind to help us to understand. We're going to need your eyes to help us to see clear. May we now have the mind of Christ, the eyes and ears of the Spirit, in Jesus' name. Amen. Offense. Man, I want to start out by asking you. <laughs> some people are like, don't you give me that mic. I'm going to give you the mic. I want to start out by asking you, 
what you think an offense is. What do you actually think an offense is? Stacy? what do you think an offense is? Just define it for me. What's an offense? Talking into the microphone when I didn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's a perfect example, actually. No, you told me what it is as in what, what it looks like, what happens. But you didn't tell me what it is. You said, talking into a mic when I don't want to. Well, that's the action of an offense. That's the, that's the stuff going on. But what is the actual offense? It's that you don't want to talk on the mic. And then I gave you the mic. And you're saying, you're making me talk on the mic. So the offense is it actually a misunderstanding. Because I didn't make you. I didn't make you. I might have done this, but you took it and then said I made you. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Yeah, that's, that's real. So then what is an offense? If that's what's happening, really going on, what's an offense? I'm not asking you because we talked last night. <laughs> what's an offense? It, off of that it, it, demonstration, what's an offense? An offense is a misunderstanding of um, what you think somebody else is saying um, instead of what they're actually saying. Okay, that's good. So an offense is a misunderstanding of what you think somebody is saying versus what they're actually saying. Now, would you guys agree that that's a pretty close definition? So we're going to talk, say that's a, a misperceived thought, right? That's, that's, that's a perception that's actually skewed. It's wrong. It's one-sided. It's not uh, godly. It's human. Would you, could you, could we, because it's, I'm right, you're wrong. Okay. So then offense could be, you made me. I know, but I'm using both because some people are offended by me <laughs> using both. <laughs> An offense is you made me or I don't care how you, what, where you came from, what I see matters, not what you are saying. What I feel, what I believe is most important. That's another one, right? Okay, so what's an offense? You can take the mic. I don't want to be Vanna White. No. <laughs> it's when you have the heart of I'm right and you're wrong. It's Yeah. That's, that's good. What I, what's it's a good. heart posture of I'm right and you're wrong. But what if they are right? And what if the other person is wrong? How could there still be an offense if what I'm saying is right and what you're saying is wrong or what I did was right and what you did was wrong? How can there be an offense if it's right, if you're right? <clears throat> See, this is why, brothers and sisters, we're all messed up. I could keep going. Example, right? Not everybody's saying the same thing, but we're dancing around something here. So let me ask this question. Do you guys firmly believe you have a full understanding of what an offense is? Because a person who goes, yes, is going to be offended by everything. One of the biggest problems we have, I want to make sure those cameras stay on. Okay, please. If they somehow disconnect, I will pause what I'm saying to get reconnected because everyone needs to hear this. One of the problems with our society today in America, I don't know how to turn this off. Do I, which way? Okay. It's bugging me. I would rather sweat and be clear. One of the problems, and that's actually very prophetic, by the way. Some of us want comfort over clarity. Just saying. In the problem with our time today, in this country today, is we actually plan for a future as though it will come. That's the truth. We don't got bombs going off outside right now, not in our, in our city. We're not in Israel where there's truly death going on. We're here. On top of that, the, the English language is the most demonic language. And people are like, whoa, you're going off the deep end. 
I'm going to tell you why. Because it was made by man, not God. Even though God allowed it, man made it. And it exposes man's hearts because man actually made it to where you try to use one word to express five things and everybody's confused. Like, I love you. Well, what kind of love are you talking about? A brotherly love, a friendly love, an unconditional love, a, a marital love? What kind of love are you talking about? Because we use the word love, but we don't know what we're talking about. So could it be, po- could it be that the word offense has multiple meanings, but we act like ours is the only one? Oh, and let's go a little bit deeper because it gets really, really dangerous. We're in a time where we're so comfortable and talking in such a way that's so comfortable that we don't know what the heck we're saying, and then we pick up a Bible with a mind that's comfortable and talking about things that we don't know what we're saying and try to interpret this without the Spirit of God, and we mishandle the Scripture. We mishandle it. Would you say amen to that? Man, I wish my brother Philip was here. Philip's not here right now? Philip, come here. Grab him, tell him to come here. Philip, get up here, brother. You might have to run. Come here, Phil. My brother, whom I love, is one of my closest, dearest friends. This is my brother. We have been through so much together. And if you've been in this church for any length of time, you know what we walked through not too long ago. Now, let me ask you. If there was anybody in this place that could be offended, couldn't it be him? I love you. I I know you do. (laughs) But he's not. He's not. A lot of us can learn something from him. But let me say something. Many of us think we're better. And Philip, if we've ever thought we were, forgive us, brother. I love you. Forever. We love you, Phil. Amen. I want to encourage you in that. Thank you, brother, for coming up. I love you. But it's true. Jesus would tell people, if you say you love God, but you hate your fellow believer in your heart, you're a liar. That's what he said through the scriptures. You're a liar. And when we think we're better than the next person, we are liars. So offense is safe to say that we don't know what it is. We know how we feel, but we don't necessarily know what it is. And so God spoke to me, said, I'm going to give you this word. And I wrote these things down. I looked it up and I said, okay, God, I pray that as I communicate this message, freedom would ring. That people would literally see that everything that we go through in this life with Christ is spiritual. And that we would separate our carnal, natural, fleshly understanding from what God is actually saying and throw out our dependency on ourselves and cling to Christ. Do you want to cling to Christ this morning? Let all of God's people who are filled with the Spirit be praying throughout this sermon for those that are not filled with the Spirit, that they would be filled with the Spirit so they can receive the freedom that, that we all have. And you are going to be so blessed today because even as I went and said, what is offense? You're, you're subconsciously thinking you know what this sermon is about, and you're about to have your whole mind blown. What is an offense? I looked up three main definitions of offense. The first is this, something that outrages the moral or physical senses. So a person standing on the corner with a microphone preaching Jesus to a city that doesn't want to hear about Jesus is offensive. Just look at some of the things that you see online. Recently, uh, uh, Bishop Mar- Mari or whatever his name is was preaching and, and a man came up and stabbed him in the middle of his sermon because the man was offended at the message he was preaching. Now that kind of changes what an offense is. Why are people offended by Jesus? He isn't physically here. Or is he? See, people are offended by the truth. So offense, true offense, is coming against the truth. True offense is the truth coming against you. That's true offense. False offense is lie coming against lie. It's not really an offense. 
Man coming against man. It's not really a, an offense. The only offense there really is, is man coming against God and God coming against man. That's the only offense there really is. Do you agree? Do you agree? I'm going to show you this morning whether you agree or not. It is what it is. So again, it's offensive to be on the corner preaching Jesus to a world that doesn't want to hear about him. The second one was the state of being insulted or morally outraged. So there is a moral standard that man creates. I like mustard. I like ketchup. If I ask for ketchup and you give me mustard, I'm offended. I paid for your service. I'm giving you a tip. I deserve to get what I ask for. It's a perceived thought. It's something that you say is a standard that really is no standard at all. Number three, a cause or, or occasion of sin. Now that's interesting that one of the Webster's Dictionary's uh, 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 descriptions of offense is a cause of sin or an occasion of sin. Now wait a minute. Sin is only sin if it's against God. Some people say, no, you could sin against your man. Yeah, but the, the sin is still a standard of God. It's not a standard of man. That's why if you lie to your brother, you're lying to God. Come on, somebody. That's why when you manipulate your brother, you're manipulating God. That's why when you operate against your fellow believer in a demonic way, you're doing it towards God. That's offensive to God. Would you agree? One of the greatest signs that someone has an offense based on man's standards is fault finding. You troll people's Facebook to see what they're saying in order to find something wrong to further prove your case. Fault finding. That is not the spirit of God. You know, reform doctrine, their doctrine might be solid, but they got a big error. They go online to fault find heretics. They make it their job to try to point out false teachers. They have no basis of this. In the scriptures, Paul even writes and says, as long as Christ is being preached. He even says, I have no influence outside the sphere God has given me. But within the church, I have every authority to come and act and move and be. But outside of what God has given me, let it be. Amen. People have taken the holy scriptures and have justified to themselves why they can go after faults. It is not our job as believers to try to find faults in people. Would you agree with that? Are there faults in people? And who knows them all? Amen. Within family, we work them out. Within family, we walk them out. You don't run when you find a fault with a family member. You dig deep. You get in there with them. You stay until it's worked out. Come on, somebody, help me. You cannot bail on believers. You want to scroll through your text messages, you want to scroll through your friends list, you want to call somebody and try to find out something wrong, you're being led by the devil. God didn't tell you to do that. Come on. You guys know you've done it. Okay, how many of y'all got a Facebook? How many got an Instagram, a TikTok? You going to tell me you ain't, you ain't went and looked at what somebody was saying that you upset with? And tell me you went to look for something good in them. Tell me you went to look. Matter of fact, everything good they do, you're like, ugh. <laughs> ugh. I hate how good that is. <laughs> <laughs> We're liars. We act like we don't do these things. And we do them. Go real quick. It's funny because if I were to say, I'm going to give you an example of an offense, okay? The, the misunderstanding, right, the, the, the perceived notion, the, the man's standard, like, if you cross this line in my life, I'm offended. What every believer should be saying 
is if you offend God, if you offend God, then I'm rightfully offended. That offense now comes with mercy because I once offended God. Come on, somebody. I once was God's enemy and I had all the offenses and God gave me mercy. So if you offend God, that means you offend me. But guess what comes out of me when you offend God? Mercy. Amen. Mercy comes out of me. Not judgment. That's what believers walk in. We get insulted, we don't retaliate with insults. We get persecuted, we pray for those who persecute us. Come on, brothers and sisters, you know this is true. But I'm going to show you something. There's people who literally have said, Tony, and I'm going to speak personally, you preach from emotion. <laughs> Would you say I preach out of emotion? Would you say I have some emotion going on here? You see emotion coming out of me? But is it that which is leading me? But I'm a, I'm a very expressive person, and so are you. Don't you lie now. <laughs> but hold on, hold on. You're not supposed to preach with emotion. All right, let's read some scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 14. This is Paul writing to Timothy. Now, before we read, don't, don't go ahead. Look up here. Before we read, I don't want anybody to jump in ahead because it's important. Before we read, is this the Holy Scriptures? Yes. Divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yes. That means everything in there is for our learning. Amen. Amen. So how about this? It's not just don't uh, lean on your own understanding. It's not that. It's also this. It's also this. Let's hear what the scriptures have to say. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Paul writes to Timothy and says, Alexander, say Alexander. That's somebody's name, brother and sister. Hold up a second. You're not supposed to mention somebody's name if it's tied to something bad. Especially to the church. You're not supposed, hey, you're supposed to be happy-go-lucky in the church. Hey, everything is good. Huh? Or... Everything is awesome. No. <laughs> You're not supposed to talk about people in the church. Okay, well, let's read the Bible that talks about people in the church. Can we do it? You know why they say don't do that? Because there's young Christians who are going to take it out of context. Now, let me show you the truth. I'm going to preach the truth so the heart of every person can be exposed so they actually can find forgiveness and freedom and their lives can be changed. Because that's how people actually get changed is they actually manifest. They actually manifest, because guess what? If you don't do it here, they're doing it there anyways. And there's no better place to manifest than in the presence of God, because he's the one that knows how to take the manifesto and turn it into obedience. I want people free. Say Alexander. All right, now say your own name. <laughs> you guys are not, hey, yeah, say your own name. He said your own name. Would you want your name in the Bible for thousands of years from billions of people to read about your sin? Paul, by Paul, is Paul not like one of the most anointed men in the scriptures that we see accounts of? I mean, he literally was used by God. Would you want Paul to put your name there? What about Jesus? Oh, but Tony, but you, see how, see how we are? See how we are? Listen, Alexander, the coppersmith. Oh, then he exposes them. Because there might be a lot of Alexanders, but there may be only one coppersmith. <laughs> right? Isaac, the disciple, right? Like, <laughs> what's your Bible say? Did me what? Now, wait a minute. Paul writing about another man doing him much harm? I'm outraged. How dare you, Paul? You don't know Alexander's faith. You don't know if he repented. You know how long it takes to write a letter and send it before it gets to somebody and they actually read it? Could it be that Alexander repented in the meantime? By the time they get the letter, a month later, Alexander did me harm. Wait a minute, I just saw him praising the Lord like two seconds ago. Possible. I'm not saying it happened. I'm just saying, could it be? Anything could happen. But wait a minute. Paul says, he did me much harm. Just because Alexander changed and repented and is freed doesn't mean that he didn't do Paul harm. 
And Paul has the right as a child of God to express himself emotionally in the spirit to say what hurt him. And the people of God don't get to scrutinize Paul for being real. The only people who scrutinize people for being real are people who are putting on a mask and lying to you. And you know it in your own homes and in your own workplaces. People who are hiding lie to you. You know that you've done it. I've been an Alexander. That's why I can read this and have freedom. A true free person like Alexander would read that in the confidence of Christ and go, I thank God I'm not there anymore. Paul, please forgive me for harming you. And Paul being filled with the Spirit go, no problem. And I still have to write your name for their learning. And Alexander would say, it's all right. All my stuff's before the Lord anyways. I'm under an anointing this morning, brothers and sisters. God is moving right now. It doesn't stop there. Paul says, he's done me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. How offensive. How many of you would want that said about you? It's in your Bible. Don't get mad at me. I'm just the messenger bringing things to the light. How many of us would want the pastor to say about you, God will judge them? Would you want me to say that? You guys are real quiet right now. Just be honest. You don't want me to say that about you. But can I give you the heart posture of Paul? Let me go back. If you can bring me up the, um, the New King James Version. I want to read you a different translation. Be yes, because we get caught up on words. We hear the word judge and we're like, nobody's supposed to judge anybody. Just 14. We, we hear judge and we're like, that's wrong. You're not, man's not supposed to judge. He said, the Lord's going to judge. Okay, well, that's right. But I don't want to be judged by God. But you are being judged by God. Everybody's being judged by God. Now, let me read you the New King James version of judge. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Oh, that's a lot different than judge him. Because our understanding of that word is broken. No, may the Lord repay him. Now, let me ask you, is it right for God to repay us? Is that not what we're doing? I mean, we're held accountable for everything we say and do. You reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you reap destruction. If you sow to the spirit, you reap eternal life. Is it not fair for us as believers to say, let me hand them over to the Lord? Why? So they would have demise? So they would actually be cut off from God? Paul's not talking like that because you need to know the heart of the person because it's the heart of God in the person. He's saying it like this. Let all of us stand corrected right now. He's saying it like this. God loves Alexander and he chastises those he loves. And he will repay Alexander according to his works so that he would come back to God. That's the heart posture Paul's talking from. He is not talking from human offense. Therefore, we should not read through human offense. Even now, as I talk like this, there's people probably online and people who in here that might be saying, Tony, it sounds personal. It is personal. It's very personal. And it should be personal to you too. You should be hearing this scripture and tying it right to things in your life right now for it to be real. You should not be looking at me as though it's only tied to me because it's tied to you too. Aren't you thankful for that? Say praise God because you got to be thankful for that. So now I sit here and I go, wait a minute. Paul says, Alexander, the coppersmith. Paul Jr., the mechanic. <laughs> Miguel, the trucker, right? <laughs> I'm not going to say what he wore last week. I was <laughs> has done me much harm, but the Lord will judge him for what he has done. Be careful of him, for he fought against everything we did. He fought against everything we did. Now, your Bible says that, right? You read it with me, right? You're not, I'm not making this up. Okay, so is there a place for emotion? Is there a place to talk about things in the church? 
You know, there's people who won't go to a church when you talk about things. You start talking about things and people get scared. They get embarrassed. They're like, oh, what if that's me next? You are next. (laughs) You are next. Every one of us is next because God loves every one of us. And he doesn't want a church divided in secrecy, but united in transparency. And that means it's got to get ugly. That means people's hearts got to be exposed. They got to feel the way they feel. They got to hate you before they can love you. You got to get slapped in the, in the faith. You know what I'm saying? You're just going to go through some things, brothers and sisters. But offense, we're still dancing on this because I haven't gotten there. I'm just laying this out for you. I'm giving you an example. Do you think Alexander had a right to be offended in his flesh? In his flesh, do you think he was offended? If he'd ever got free, do you think like years later, he'd look back at that and like, that's still in that document? Gosh, dang it. Will somebody wipe that out, please? It's not true. I didn't harm him. It wasn't harm. It was just a little playful banter. Paul was just taking things a little too serious. He was on a mission for God and maybe it was just bad timing. Do you think that he would, if it was in his flesh, he would try to justify himself? Would you like your name written in the, in the book? <laughs> Come on, guys. But God allows us, and this isn't the only place that names are mentioned. There are other places, and this isn't the only place where a person is warned. Like the, Paul says, be careful of him because he resisted everything we said. Well, what does that mean? He, that means Paul was giving him truth and Christ, and he was resisting it the whole time. And let me tell you, the, let me just tell you the obvious is when Alexander is in front of the church and acts like he's not resisting, but then behind closed doors is resisting everything Paul's saying and makes it hard for Paul to be heard by people who are carrying offenses. That's the truth. This is the truth. People get offended in the flesh. Watch this. How should we handle these offenses? How should they be handled? Go real quick to Matthew 18. All right, we're about to get deep into this, okay? Because I still haven't given you really what the offense is, but if you're in the spirit, you're starting to pick up on it. Matthew 18, verse 15. Are you being blessed so far? All right, now we're gonna talk about believers, sinning against one another. If you, or if another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. Amen? Go privately and point out the offense. Immediately what we should notice is that offense, out of those three definitions that I gave you, the offense in the scriptures that it's talking about here in Matthew 18 is talking about the third one that I said, which says that it is an an occasion of sin or a a moment of sin. Offense and sin. Sin against God means sin against people. So if your fellow believer sins against you, not against your moral standard, not against your personal preferences, not against the earthly things you love, if they sin against you as a believer against the standards of Christ. See, they have to sin against God to sin against you. There is no way to sin against you unless it's against God. Do you see that? I'm going to show you this. This is very important because inside the church, people get offended over everything but Jesus. And the crazy thing is, they can't see that that is them getting offended by Jesus when they get offended over everything else. That They can't see that the reason why they're walking in their flesh offended by everything else is because they're actually offended by Jesus telling them what their flesh is wanting isn't important. Let me say it again. People of God get offended by Jesus when they want what they want to be as important as Jesus. And he goes, it's not. You got to give that up. But it's my spouse. They're not me. But it's my kids. They're not me. But you would want me to have my spouse and kids, not without me. Come on, somebody. And then you get offended when somebody who's been walking with you stands with Jesus between you and what you love. 
And now you demonize the vessel God uses in order to righteously lift yourself up and make yourself better than you really are. This is what happens in, the, in, the, in the, what he's talking about. A believer sinning against you is a believer sinning against God. So what if I were to tell you this? What if I were to tell you that if I as a pastor come and I say, Paul Jr., what you're looking at is going to lead you to hell. That is leading to destruction. That does not lead to Jesus. And you go, but I prayed for it and Jesus gave it to me. Not to worship it, Paul, but to surrender it. I don't like that, Tony. It sounds like you're spiritually manipulating me. This is what we do, guys. And I go, Paul, I'm not manipulating you. You're ma manipulating you. And I'm standing with Jesus who says, I don't want you worshiping any other God and you're worshiping the thing you love. And I'm just here to tell you, I can't stand with that. Do you see how offense, what if I were to tell you that I didn't sin against you there, though you'll take that scripture and say, I did. You'll say, brother, that hurt me. That, that, that hurts me. And you know what? You're, you're offending me and you're not supposed to offend me. You're my pastor. <laughs> Come on, church. You're not supposed to offend me. So you know what? The Bible says I need to come to you and tell you how you offended me. No, it's not talking about your offenses in the flesh. How did I offend Christ in you? And then I'll listen to you. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. It's how did I get offended by Christ? But what if I were to tell you that I'm actually the one that you're offending by not receiving the truth? Now I have to go to you privately and I have to say, brother, you're making it hard for me to lead you. You're making it hard for me to guide you. I'm giving you the truth of the gospel and you're resisting the truth. And then he doesn't listen. What does it say? Watch this. If another believer sins against you, go privately and point out the offense. If the other person listens and confesses it, you have won that person back. Hold up. Isn't that the goal? is to come back into the unity of Christ, not to break up over spilt milk, not to break up over temporary things, but to hold to the eternal thing. Isn't that what we're all here for? Come on, somebody. Then what do you do? But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again. Just anybody or people who know the standards in which Christ is, is calling us to live. That's called other people who are giving up their lives that are not worshiping their spouses or worshiping their kids or worshiping their jobs. You take two spirit-filled people with you and you say, brother, you're worshiping the wrong thing. This is what it really means to, to go to somebody who's sinned against you because they've actually sinned against God. Do you see this? So when a person worships what they love over God, they offend the entire church. It's not, an, it's not an earthly offense. It's a spiritual offense. Do you see that? They offend the entire work of God because they have made something else God. So we go with a couple other people and then if they don't listen, we go before the entire church and the church is supposed to already be spirit-filled. And we don't go, shame on you, shame on you. You're not listening. We come and we say, brother, sister, all of us are giving up our lives for the gospel. All of us are surrendering our wives and our kids and our jobs for this gospel. You are struggling with giving your life for it and you love your job, your kids and your spouse more than God. We're begging you, surrender your life to God so you don't get misled. We're begging you, don't remain in that false offense. Because this is the true offense. Some people say it's wrong to be offended, not if it's for Christ. Because that offense doesn't condemn people, it redeems people. That offense actually puts a righteous anger in you for someone who doesn't know how to have it for themselves. So when the scripture goes on and says, okay, someone sins against you, what's that sin against God? Let's make it easy. Lying. Stealing, coveting, envy, right? If I lie to you, I'm lying to God. 
Do you see that? So therefore, it's a sin against God, which is a sin against you, which doesn't come from Christ, but it comes from our flesh. Very easy. So it's easy to see that the sin is not preference. Brother, I got white shoes on. You knew I had white shoes, and you stepped all over them. How dare you? I'm going to let that sit. Maybe it's not shoes. Maybe it's your purse, ladies. Whatever it is, your brother and sister in the faith are not more important than your scuffed shoes. You know, we're not walking around trying to, trying to tear down lost people. You have a drug addict husband, a drug addict wife, a drug addict son, a drug addict daughter, and they want to come high to church? Okay, fine. We'll, we'll see if we can get them into a place of freedom, right? We're going to give them Jesus, but they keep coming and they keep coming, and now they're getting mad. Now they're causing dissension. Now they're not surrendering to God. It's just a huge distraction inside of the home. And you're going to get mad if we say, maybe we should tend to them outside of the fellowship. What do you mean? The, the church is a hospital. I'm supposed to be able to bring sick people here. He's been here for a year and he's not turning to God. So we now have to do it a different way. Do you trust the love that's in that? Or are you going to be offended because it's not your preference? You know what's cold about people who get offended in the flesh? You'll cry with them, laugh with them, marry them, bury them. You'll do everything in their life and they'll get one moment where they got a bowl of soup and they'll throw out all the grace that was shown to them, all the mercy, and they'll say, not over this one though. This time, I'm not letting you do it. I'm not letting you take my bowl. That's true. This is the real. And they'll throw out all of God's work. They will. Has anybody ever had that happen? You ever gave your life, <laughs> served somebody, opened your home? I mean, did everything, never asked for anything from them. And all they did was take. And then when something they loved more than you, more than God. See, if somebody's an unbeliever, I already know what to expect. They're not going to love me because they don't know how to love me. So they're going to slap me, kick me. They're going to run me over with a car. They're going to do all those things no matter how kind I am to them. And I don't expect them to be kind to me. I, the love I give is free. But a brother and sister who claims Christ, I expect the Lord to come out of you, especially if you're claiming the Lord. Oh, okay, okay. I, I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm like, let me just lay a little more foundation here. You sin against God, steal, slander, lie, all these things means you sin against others. Sinning against is not someone not meeting your expectations. It is only if they have actually sinned against God, which would justify sinning against you. Can you agree with that? So there's a difference between man's expectation and God's holy standard, which is in Christ. What happens when you go privately? You go uh, with two or three, and then you go before the church. The scriptures say in Matthew 18, look at this, verse 17, if the person still refuses to listen, take the case to the church, then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, treat the person like a pagan or a corrupt tax collector. We're so broken, we think those terms, pagan and corrupt tax collector, are negative terms. Let me ask you, is the word homeless negative to you? Is the word prostitute negative to you? Do you tie the negative term and say the person is tied to that term? See, what's happening in our hearts, even right now as God is revealing, is we think we're better than a tax collector and a prostitute. Because I just asked you, do you think those terms are bad? Yes. Do you think you're those terms? No. <laughs> but you are. You are just like all of them. And so when it says, treat them like that, it is not talking negatively. It's saying, okay, if I go to Paul Jr. and I say, Paul Jr., with a true offense, listen, brother, you're worshiping something more than God. He gets upset at me because he thinks I'm trying to take away what he loves. Okay? 
And now all of a sudden, he's mad. He doesn't want to listen. I bring two or three brothers with me. I say, hey, brother, I try to tell you that thing is going to lead you astray. You're loving that more than God. He goes, man, you're just trying to get in the way of, of my calling and what God has for me, blah, 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 right? Doesn't listen. I said, okay, church, this is the issue. He's loving that more than he's loving God. Will you guys be the judge? You know, half of you would say, I don't want to get in the middle of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you're the church. You're supposed to be in the middle of it. Otherwise, if Jesus says, take it to the church, what churches are we supposed to take it to? You're the church. You're supposed to be in the middle of it. You're not supposed to not know the name, not know what's going on. You're supposed to know what's going on. They're your brother and sister. And then they go, hey, guy, you're doing this. Don't do it. And you're like, I don't believe what you guys are all under a spell. You're listening to that guy. You're not listening to God. I'm out of here. Do you know that happens? A lot. Then we go, okay, church, we're supposed to treat him like a pagan or a tax collector. Do you know what it means? This is what it means, brother. Hear the heart of Jesus. Clearly, he couldn't receive from us. That means he's not receiving from God. Can we pray that God open his heart and mind? Can we intercede for him like we would a lost person because he's clearly lost his way? And now we pray and we intercede for him to come back home. That's what it means. We do not condemn unbelievers. We ask unbelievers to come back to God. So a person who claims to be a believer who's now strayed, we treat them like an unbeliever and say, come back to God. Come back to God. We don't condemn them. They're already under condemnation. Help me, church. So we need to understand what's going on in the person who thinks they're offended, <laughs> and they are in the flesh because they don't want to let go what they love, but they truly have offended the work of God, and they can't see it. Amen. What do we do? We need to understand what's going on. Now, listen to this. I wrote this down. Offended people in the flesh mishandled the scripture in order to argue and prove their point and support their case of offense. They'll go, wait a minute. The Bible says I need to call you out because you're trying to stop me from getting what is rightfully mine. <laughs> and they can't see that they've made it an idol, right? So they start using the scripture. I'm going to give you another example of it. Go to Matthew, uh, verse 7, right up here in Matthew 18. Watch this. It's crazy because as I was going through this whole thing with trusting God, I came across this post and somebody posted the uh, New King James version of this, of this, of this. And we're going to read a couple. But they, basically he posted this and I was like, oh man, this is, this is good because God's already speaking. Listen to what it says. I'm going to read you this in the New Living Translation. Matthew 18, 7. What sorrow awaits the world? Key, key, the what? And awaits the what? Okay, who? Very important. Sorrow does not await the believer. Come on, brothers and sisters. Sorrow doesn't wait the believer. It waits the world. It awaits the world. What sorrow awaits what? The world. So if you think that this applies to a fellow believer, you are mishandling scripture. This applies to the world, not to the believer. What sorrow awaits the world? Because it, say it, tempts, see this? People to sin. So the world tempts people to sin. What's in the world? Everything, the lust of the eye, the lust of the, of, of the flesh, and the pride of life. Everything that we see, touch, and feel. The things that are temporary that grab our hearts. That's the world. Amen. That includes the person next to you. Grab them right now. Just put your hand on their shoulder. That's real. That's real. Touch that person. Their flesh is in the world. Amen. Their flesh is in the world. Amen. Brothers and sisters, you love that person? Okay, but, but it's not the flesh that you're loving. Okay, because the flesh is going to leave you. All right? So they are not the flesh. They're born again. They're a believer. So you love the, the spirit-filled, born-again believer, not the flesh. So you can look at that person and say, I love your spirit, but I can let go of your flesh. But some people believe that God has given them the promise of the flesh. No, he's giving you the promise of the spirit. Okay, very important to see this. The world in Michelle, not Michelle. 
Because Michelle is redeemed and filled with the Spirit. So it, it would only be the world in Michelle that would tempt me to sin, not Michelle. Y'all ain't hearing that. Michelle without God would tempt me to sin. Michelle in God tempts me to live, promotes me to live. Michelle without God tells me, you better use it before it runs out. Better spend it because you may never have it. Better save it because you may never have it. Come on, somebody. Use it because you don't know if you'll get a second chance. The, the flesh, the world promotes the lust of the flesh. Do you see that? But the God in Michelle says, let it go because it's already gone already. It's just a matter of time. It's like a vapor. Don't hold on to it. Love, love her, but don't love the vessel. Come on, somebody help me. So the world is the one that tempts us to sin. Temptation, temptations are inevitable, inevitable, but sorrow, what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? All right, we, we're about to get deep now. Some people got to get free. Because some of y'all looking at the other person going, see, they did tempt me. No, there's only one tempter. And that's why he's going to hell. His name is Satan. And what sorrow awaits Satan for doing the tempting? Great sorrow. He can never be saved. You can be saved. And that person who you're holding a grudge against because they're trying to take what you love can be saved. So it's very important that we see the attachment of this. That when we go back over and he tells us how to handle sin, if a believer sins against you, what kind of sin is he talking about? He's talking about the same sin here. The sin that takes the focus off of God and puts it onto the world. That's the only way you can sin against another believer is if you actually try to put the world in front of them. Do you see this? If I start telling you to depend on the world and, you, and I claim Christ, run from me. You say, how, how do you do that, Tony? People don't just walk up and say, depend on the world. No, they don't. But here's what they do. God wants you blessed. Yeah, yeah. God wants you to have money, finances. Can I just, like, can we tear that apart right now? Yeah, God wants you to have health and wealth. God wants you to have a happy marriage. Does he? Anybody in here got 100% happiness in your marriage? <laughs> Come on now. What is happiness? According to God, that's Christ. According to man, that's the world. And that's why there's no happiness in a marriage. It's because they're building happiness on the world. And when you build happiness on the world, let me just keep it real. I like oranges cut a certain way. She likes oranges cut a certain way. And then we fight because we don't want to cut the orange the same way. Am I lying? She eats her french fries and then her burger. Am I lying? I eat my burger and then my french fries. So I'm not sharing with her. Because she's going to eat all of my fries before I get to them. Do you, see, do you see what we do in the flesh? Do you see what we do? But when it's Christ, you can have my fries. You can have my burger too. Because it's not about the fries and burgers. And I refuse to divide with you over fries and burgers. Because I have Christ. I have Christ. Do you have Christ, brothers and sisters? Now, we see the word, the word here. It says, what well, sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin. Remember, this message is about offense, right? We thought we knew what offense was. In the NIV, instead of temptation, it says stumble. What sorrow awaits the person who causes someone to stumble? In the New King James, it says offense. What sorrow awaits the one who does the offending? The reason why we have to understand there's a difference between being offended by God and offended by man is because it produces a freedom for your life so you know how to rightly divide the truth. Watch this. Go to Galatians 2. Hmm. 
Actually, sorry, go to Romans 9, Romans 9. Because some people would say, well, God would never tempt me. Amen. God doesn't tempt us. Scriptures say that. But God would never cause me to stumble, and God would never offend me. It's 100% true, brother and sister. God will never tempt you with the world. Right? He'll never tempt you with the world. He doesn't move like the adversary. He doesn't come and go, hey, won't you come to me because I got stuff for you? God don't move like that. But he does beckon you to come. He does, quote unquote, it's not temptation, but for the lack of a better word, puts before you a drawing to come to him, a wooing, amen. Because isn't that what temptation is? It, it draws the lust out of your flesh. Well, God doesn't draw the lust out of your flesh, but he calls the spirit home. He calls the spirit home. So I don't know what that word is. I'm not going to use temptation because I don't want to offend the religious person. But he calls you home. But then let's go a little further. Is God not going to cause me to stumble? Oh, really? Hmm, God doesn't cause people to stumble. Let's go to the Bible and see what it says. Romans chapter 9, verse 30. God doesn't cause people to stumble. Interesting! I wonder what the Bible says. <laughs> verse 30. What does all this mean? Even though the Gentiles were not trying to follow God's standards, they were made right with God. And it was by faith that this took place. But the people of Israel, the chosen people, the ones who knew the law, the people who had the law, the ones who which it came through, tried so hard to get right with God by keeping the law. They never succeeded. Why not? Because they were trying to get right with God by keeping the law instead of by what? Trusting in him. What's this whole season about? You want to be made right with God? You got to trust God. Do you know there's people right now that are abandoning ship? They're supposed to be trusting God and they are running for their lives because they want what they have on this earth. They don't really want God. Watch this. They stumbled. Is that what your Bible says? What happened? Wait a minute, but God wouldn't cause me to stumble. Well, let's read. They stumbled over what? The great rock in their path. God warned them of this in the scriptures when he said, I am placing a stone in Jerusalem that makes people stumble. A rock that makes them fall. But anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Woo! Glory to God! Do you know why I'm yelling? Because I'm not stumbling. I'm not falling over Jesus. I'm standing on him. And the amazing thing about it is when you actually stand on Jesus, the person who's stumbling is like, why aren't you catching me? You know what I mean? Like, you're stumbling too. No, I'm standing, but brother, come on. Sister, come on, because I can't come off of where I'm standing because I'll fall too. But I can, I can reach to you. I can, I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not standing here to look better than you. We remain, and he keeps us, but people stumble over Christ. Let's be honest. Have you ever stumbled over him? So then wait, this offense that we get, this offense that we have is really with Jesus? It's not really with people? It is really with the Lord? Let's go to Galatians 2, 17 through 18. You know, it was my prayer. Forgive me if I burp in the mic. It was my prayer that you guys would receive this today. That you would actually hear what Jesus is saying to all of us. I'm going to take it a step further because I used the example of Paul loving something and, the, and him getting offended if I stood and said, Paul, you're loving that more than God. And I was like, and he gets offended. That is a fleshly offense. That's just the offenses of the flesh. That's not the true offense against God. Okay? Him saying, no, I don't want to listen to you, offends God. 
but not because he says no. It's the heart behind that no, and I'm going to show it to you. Because a person who chases what they love is trying to be made right with God by works. They want to prove that what they're holding on to is the right thing, and now they're going to argue to the death until they're right. And they're going to say, see, it's good. See, it's right. See, it's good. Look, they're doing this. I'm doing this. And they're going to claim all their works. I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible. We read our Bibles together. God does not care about our works. Those are all expressions of the faith we have. They're not meant to be badges of, or merits that we put before people and say, this is why I'm righteous. But that's what ends up happening. When he feels rejected because God has rejected his love for the thing rather than him loving God, now he's going to go as hard as he can to prove that what he's chasing is right by God. He's going to do everything to prove it right. Do you see that? He's going to go to the, the umpteenth extent. He's going to go as far as he can because he doesn't want to be wrong. So then the real issue with, with God, this real offense with God is that we're actually not walking by faith and we're not trusting God. And we say we are, and we wear that as a mask while we're trying to work for something that may not even be promised to you. Galatians 2, 17, I'm almost done. But suppose we seek to be made right with God through faith in Christ, and then we are found guilty because we have abandoned the law. Would that mean Christ has led us into sin? Because you know the law is good, right? Right? The, the Ten Commandments, would you say that? That's a, those are good, right? Do not murder. That's a good thing. But do you know that you can't keep that? <laughs> because when you hate in your heart, you're murdering. Right? It's the same as murder when you hate in your heart. So we're guilty. Amen? So then the law cannot be kept by you. So what he's saying is it actually, putting your faith in Christ means you stop trying to keep the law. Let's read it. Would this mean that he led us into sin? Absolutely not. Rather, watch this. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. If I rebuild the old system of the law, I already tore down. For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by what? By what? Right. Trusting in the Son. Trusting in the Son. So then what is the offense? What is going on with humanity? Because it all boils down to a very simple thing. You're just not trusting in Christ. And when you don't trust in Christ, it offends God because God gave him at a very high cost. God gave him at a very high cost not to condemn you because you're already condemned by trying to keep the law. See, when you try to keep the law, it condemns you because when you try not to murder and then you hate your brother, you're condemned. Do you see this? And then it offends God because you're trying to achieve righteousness in your own strength rather than depending on Christ. See, so that's why when you're not depending on Christ and you're trying to receive righteousness in your own strength and you fall in love with something temporary, all you can do is be a law-abiding citizen. Some of y'all are going to catch that later. All you can do is try to keep the law now. All right, I'm going to speak to it. Let me give you an example. Anybody here ever fall in love? Wanting to do it the right way, you end up sleeping with each other before marriage anyways? But you didn't want to do it, but you did it. Anybody? It was like, I'm going to stay pure until we get married. Oops. What happened? We wanted to stay pure. What happened is you didn't put your trust in Christ for the purity. You tried to keep yourself from falling. Therefore, you fell because it was already in your heart to fall. You cannot keep it. Somebody might say, well, we did. We waited until we were married. We came close. Well, we didn't go all the way there. It was in your heart. That's, what, that's the failure is you loved it more than you loved Jesus. 
And because you don't love Jesus more than it, anyone who comes between you and it, you're mad at. Remember last, uh, not a couple weeks ago when I spoke on um, uh, suff- long suffering, I spoke about this a while back, but I said, I was talking about offenses and I think I brought it up again that the true root of offense is discontentment. You guys remember that? Can you see why? Discontentment happens because you are trying to do something and it's not producing the results that you want it to produce. As a matter of fact, you keep failing to the very standard that is set there and therefore you keep on being discontent. But God doesn't want you discontent which means he doesn't want you loving the flesh because you will only be discontent in the flesh. He wants you free. And so I wrote this down because you might be accused one day the way that I described. You might be going through it right now with your family. You might be standing for Christ and they're mocking you while you're standing for Christ. They hate you because you're standing for Christ. Amen, does that happen? You got, you got it. It's happening in your homes. It's happening at your job. You're standing for Christ and people hate you and they accuse you. And you're like, look, I'm just trying to, sh- I'm just trying to show the love that's really been given to me to you. And there is no other love like this. And you're literally standing and they're like, nah, nah, nah. You're just a party pooper. This is why we don't invite you to any of our, our uh, employee get togethers and stuff, because you come in with this Jesus and you just ruin everything. Make me feel like I can't drink. Let me tell you something as a believer who stands accused. Because I'm accused all the time, guys. You don't understand. Preaching this gospel, I get accused all the time. I'm not hyping that up. It happens all the time. Almost six years I've been leading this church from six people to now. And I'm telling you, the more people that come, the more accusations I get. And they don't even know that the person from 100 times ago said the same thing they're saying and loved the world too. And I've been standing for Jesus the whole time and I'm getting slapped around. And, you know, I count it a great privilege because at least what comes out of me is Christ. I mean, I can stand before God and I know that I'm doing what God has me to do and I'm not trying to defend myself. Slap me, kick me, throw me to the side. I was never in this to be accepted by everybody. I was never in this to be adored by everybody. I only want the acceptance of God. And if other brothers and sisters understand that, I want them with me. I want to do it all together. But here's what I wrote down. The ones accused of the offense will either stand guilty or innocent first before God and second before people. There is no escaping the skeletons in your closet. So people want to come and stand here? Guess what you're going to have to do if you want to stand here? And this is not me boasting. This is me shuddering under the reality of what I walk in. You better have your pocketbook open. You better have every door and closet in your house open. You cannot hide anything if you're standing up here. Why? Not so you can be of good, uh, have a good reputation, but that other people would not have an excuse because you have to live upright so they would be free. It is a, it is a work of God. There is no escaping it, but you better know you're going to be broke naked before people. You're going to be torn down and everybody's going to see everything. First with God and with people. You better know that. Now, it doesn't just happen by being a pastor. It's as a believer. Oh, Lord, help me right now. I'm getting so stirred. You got it. Please bear with me, church. Please bear with me. Four more minutes at least. Please, just bear with me. Some of y'all live in apartments, and you got a Jesus banner on your door. But people hear you cussing on the inside. Why are they cussing? How about because you love the world and not that banner on your door? Can you be honest? I'm not saying take the banner down. I'm saying lay the world down. I'm saying you are also being looked at. Forget about those who live outside the home. What about those who live in the home? Come on, this isn't meant to condemn you. This is meant to free you. You're saying, expose me, Lord. Show me, Lord. I love myself more than I love you. Show me. Because I stand guilty and innocent only before you. I can't stand any other way. And the only way my innocence is before God is if God sees Christ and not me. Let me say it again. The only way I'm innocent before God is if God sees Christ and not me, if I'm covered by the blood of Jesus. This is why it's important to live an open life. So people are left with with all the evidence of Christ's fruit. If we live a closed life, then there's assumptions, false narratives, and manipulation, and it all runs rampant. But if God 
has wiped his blood over you. If God has placed his blood on you, who am I to say that it's insufficient because you offended me? Have you been offended? Are you able to tell the difference from a fleshly offense and a godly one? Because let me ask you, brother and sister, are you offended right now? Are you offended with the person next to you, with the person at the drive-thru who got your order wrong? Are you offended by the brother who hasn't called you in 20 years? Are you offended right now? Okay, let's be real. You're a believer, right? You confess the bloodshed of Jesus, right? So let's, do, let's just do an exercise right now so we can be free. Let's have a real moment with Jesus right now. Look at Jesus and tell him, I don't want to spend time with your child. You look at God right now and you tell God you don't want to spend time where, the other, where his blood is shed. You tell him right now that if you got the blood of Jesus on you and I got the blood of Jesus on me, who am I to tell God I don't want to spend time with you? I'm saying the blood is not sufficient. I am saying the blood is not sufficient. I am not allowed as a believer to say, you know, bro, we can, we can disagree and I love you unconditionally, but I want nothing to do with you. <laughs> that is wrong on every level. Come on, husbands and wives. How would that work if you were in your home with your spouse and you say, you know, I love you and I'm glad we're married, but I want nothing to do with you. Huh? Is it? No, for real. Let's be real. How would that go? Anybody here got a relationship next to them? Turn and tell the person you want nothing to do with them and how's that going to go? That's your earthly marriage. That's your temporary marriage, and you know how important that is. How much more the body of believers. You cannot tell each other you want nothing to do with each other. Because what you're saying, you're saying the blood that's on your life is not sufficient for them and only for you. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to stand like that before God. I'm not willing to tell God that. You know what I want to tell God about the people who offend my flesh? <laughs> First of all, I always want to be able to forgive because you should be able to offend my flesh to the thousandth degree and me never cut you off. If you offend Christ, you'll cut yourself off anyways if you're holding to what you love. So I don't need to remove you because you will remove yourself for whatever you love. Do you see that? I don't need to remove you. You'll remove yourself. I don't want you to leave, but you'll leave because you love something else more than you love what God is doing. You, lo you love something else more than God. But here's what I will pray over everybody who claims to be a believer. And let's say me and him, we have an offense. There's a thing going on, right? He's acting however, I'm acting however. And we just can't. And you leave or, or whatever. Because I'm not going to leave. I'm just letting you know, I'm not leaving. I'm not. But let's say you leave, okay? Because I can't leave, bro. Trust me. I'm like, I don't want to be before God like that. With a, with a whole list of people that I just cut off of my life because they didn't, they didn't make me happy in this world or whatever. I'd rather keep people around me that I disagree with and can overlook those disagreements and love and walk through that in Christ than try to say, ah, we disagree, I'm out. I don't want to do that, right? But here's what I will pray over you, even if you leave me, even if you cut me off. Here's what I'm going to pray over you. It's in Jude, verse 24. This is what I pray over you. <laughs> Glory to God. This is what I pray over you. This is what I pray over you. Listen to this. Now, all glory to God. Over the one that might cut you off, you should pray this over them. All glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. I would say to you, if, you were, if we took you before the church and now you still didn't want to listen and we we're like, bro, we're praying for mercy for you. I would say, you know what? I've walked with Paul. He might be in a moment right now where he's caught up in his bowl of soup. That's okay. I still trust God at his word, not Paul at his word. I still trust God at his word, not Paul at his word. I trust God at his word, not Paul at his word. 
And I know the times when Paul's cried before the Lord, when it's been genuine, when he repented, when he received the grace and mercy of God. I know of the times when the kingdom was shown through him. So just because he's having a moment of the flesh, I don't throw out the bloodshed of Jesus because the bloodshed of Jesus is going to bring him into glory without a single fault. It's true. So I pray this morning that you do the same. I pray this morning that we all love Jesus more than this life. And I pray this morning that you would be in relationship with Michelle and I over Jesus and not this life. I pray you like to hang out with us because we talk about the Lord. I pray you like to hang out with us because we point each other to the Lord. I pray you like to hang out with us because we lay things down for the Lord. And I pray that you would never leave just because we don't like your bowl of soup. Because we know you're not going to like ours. <laughs> I got some bowls of soup too, guys. I got them sitting right there and I'm like, God, take it. God, take it. God, take it. And you want to know what they are? You want to know what one of my bowls of soup is right now? That's right before me right now. And I'm not saying I've traded my birthright for the bowl of soup. I'm just saying you're going to have it presented. It's there all the time, like low-hanging fruit. It sits there right there. The devil puts it in front of you, and you're like, man, I really do love that. You ready for mine? It's you. It's you. I really love you. I love you so much. I lay my life down for this. But I can't hold on to you. I won't hold on to you. You would then be my bowl of soup, and you would come between me and God, and I can't do that. As much as I love you and as much as I serve and as much as I, I'm here, I cannot make you God. There's no way. So I love you and I will walk with you and I will raise your kids with you and I will cry with you and I'll do all these things that I've done many, many times and I'm doing right now, but I will not worship you. And if I ever see you worshiping me, I will tell you to stop doing that. We only worship the Lord. So... That's all I have to say, which is a lot. But that's, but that's what true offense is. True offense is that. And so maybe you have to go back and watch it and take some notes. But Father, I just pray that you help us all let go of the things we love in this life. And not to the point where we disregard them or we don't care or, or we're not serving. No, Lord, teach us how to do all of that without worshiping it. And help your body, your people, your believers to remain in fellowship in Christ. Help us to put you first and to see you in each other's lives. I'm asking, Lord, for a blessing on this congregation, on every life that come through here. I thank you, Father, that the flesh does get uncomfortable with the truth. But we praise you for that because that means the truth is setting us free. And so, God, have your way in our lives. And don't let this seed be stolen but instead let it take root and may it flourish and be fruitful in Jesus' name, amen. If anybody has questions, concerns, we didn't have time for the Q&A I wanted to do at the end, but I will make myself available. We will get on the phone. I will answer any questions you have. Maybe you have more questions about being offended or even just the message. Maybe you need clarity. Hit me up. I'm not kidding. Get Michelle's number. Get my